In the previous two videos, we looked at different perspectives on beta oxidation. The first one, we just looked at general beta oxidation for a saturated fatty acid. In the previous video, we looked at beta oxidation for a monounsaturated fatty acid, but here we need to look at a polyunsaturated fatty acid, and we'll see um, what our yield is and also um, how we actually perform beta oxidation on a polyunsaturated fatty acid. Now, what's important to realize, in humans at least, is that generally speaking, when we're talking about beta oxidation of polyunsaturated fatty acids, this generally does not occur on polyunsaturated fatty acids with more than two double bonds. So if we have a, a polyunsaturated fatty acid with three double bonds, we're generally not going to observe beta oxidation on that. It's generally reserved for when we have two double bonds or one. Okay, So we're not going to look at what happens when there's three. Okay, um, We're going to pretty much just look at two here, and our example is going to be linoleic acid. So linoleic acid is a polyunsaturated fatty acid with 18 carbons and two double bonds. Okay, um, So this is a very common one that we could see. Now, we're going to start by just having regular beta oxidation because there's really nothing hindering us here for the first three rounds. And we can see here these are going to be the bonds that are split. Okay, So three rounds of beta oxidation and we get this molecule right here. Now, a few things. First of all, if we do three rounds of beta oxidation, we can already expect to get out three NADHs, three FADH2s, and three acetyl-CoA's. And I've already tabulated those three right here. But something happens interesting, and we're going to have to deal with it in the same way that we dealt with it in the monounsaturated fatty acid. If we look at the alpha carbon, which is right here. Remember, the alpha carbon is always adjacent to this carbonyl of the thioester. So here's our alpha carbon. The beta carbon has a double bond. Okay, it's part of a double bond, and that's going to pose a problem for two reasons. One, uh, first of all, it's not a trans double bond. Uh, this pathway of beta oxidation can only deal with the trans, which is what we see right here, and what we saw just generally in the regular pathway. But also, notice it's between the wrong positions. If I was to have this trans double bond, it would have to be between the alpha and beta carbon or positions 2 and 3. Here it's actually between positions 3 and 4. So if we count from here 1, 2, 3, 4, it's between positions 3 and 4. So not only is it the wrong ge geometry being cis, uh, it's also in the wrong position. So what I'm going to have to do is use this enzyme, which we did see in the previous video. This is 3,2-trans-enoyl-CoA isomerase. All this enzyme is going to do is it's going to isomerize this double bond into a trans double bond, but also move it uh, from positions 3 and 4 to positions 2 and 3. So notice the different location of it. Here it's between 1, 2, 3, and 4. Here it's between 1, 2, and 3. So we've not only changed the location of it to the proper location, we've also changed it to the right geometry. So it's between positions 2 and 3, or the alpha and beta carbons, and uh, it's trans. Now, here's a thing that's interesting to note. We have a double bond here, right? Did we use the first enzyme in beta oxidation to accomplish that? No. Okay. Uh, we get the same result, but we did not, I repeat, we did not use the dehydrogenase to add this double bond. All we did is we took a pre-existing double bond and isomerized it. So therefore, we lose out on using this first enzyme that also means we lose out on producing one FADH2 molecule. Okay? So in this step, even though we get the same double bond here, we get it through a different means, through an isomerization, not the dehydrogenase. So in this step, we lose out on producing one FADH2. That's going to affect our overall yield in the end. But in any case, now we have this double bond here. We can now proceed with beta oxidation as normal. Okay? So for example, we're going to perform the last three enzymes of this round of beta oxidation. It's only the last three enzymes, meaning this one, this one, and this one, because we didn't need this dehydrogenase first. So only the last three enzymes are needed for this round of beta oxidation. We cut right here, get off one acetyl-CoA right here, so we've now produced four, and we've effectively shortened this by two carbons. All right, so now we have this. We've got one double bond left, and it doesn't look like it would interfere much with this. So we'll go ahead and perform the first reaction of the next round of beta oxidation. That's, again, this acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. 
This is going to give us an FADH2 as we would expect, and it puts a double bond right here. Okay, So we have a double bond right here. It's trans. But we cannot simply just do beta oxidation on this. Okay, That's not how it works. So now we have this double bond right here. It's in the proper location for beta oxidation. It's in the proper geometry. Okay, But we can't just simply do beta oxidation on this, even though we have this uh, correct double bond. And that's because we have this one over here adjacent to it. This double bond right here is in between the alpha and beta positions, or positions 2 and 3. This one's between positions 4 and 5. We need to get rid of this one. And that's going to occur through a reduction catalyzed by 2,4-dienoyl-CoA reductase. You can see over here that this double bond, it's trans, but it's in the wrong position. But it essentially gets rid of one of these and leaves us with just one. This one's actually between positions 3 and 4. So 1, 2, 3, and 4. Notice in the process of doing this, we consume an NADPH and get out an NADP. So we actually have to waste an NADPH. Now, what's important to realize is NADPH is different than NADH. Okay? They are very, very similar, but generally used for different processes. Okay? Um, NADH is what's used in the electron transport chain to uh, pump protons, as we'll see much later. NADPH is used for biosynthetic reactions generally. We'll see it used much later deep into biochem too. Okay? So even though we're using an NADPH, Okay. We sometimes call that an NADH equivalent, and we'll see how this factors in at the end uh, for our yield. But understand these are technically different molecules, but sometimes they're grouped together uh, for the sake of counting our yield. But in any case, this enzyme gets rid of two double bonds and produces one. However, it's in the wrong place. So we have to use another enzyme. We actually saw this up here. This is 3,2-trans-enoyl-CoA isomerase. This is simply going to take this 3,4 double bond and isomerize it into the 2,3 double bond. It also stays in the trans geometry. And we can use beta oxidation on this. Okay. Now, it might seem that, well, we didn't get to use the uh, dehydrogenase to put this in, so we lose another FADH2. That's not actually true. Notice that this double bond was actually put in through the dehydrogenase up here. Okay, so we started with this single bond, then we got this double bond right here. This double bond is essentially the same one as this. So we don't actually lose out on an FADH2 here. We actually got it by putting in this double bond indirectly in this step up here. Okay, and so from here we can just perform basically four separate rounds of beta oxidation. We can clip these bonds right here. And in this part right here, we're going to get out five acetyl-CoA molecules. Okay, So when we've got two double bonds in a polyunsaturated fatty acid, it's going to take a little bit more um, fooling around with the molecule in order to completely catabolize it. All right? But notice, we have these acetyl-CoAs that are produced in various steps, but they add up to nine. That makes sense because linoleic acid is an 18-carbon fatty acid. And if you remember our general rules, uh, the number of acetyl-CoAs produced is always half the number of carbons. So we have 18 carbon atoms, so we're going to generate 9, half of that, acetyl-CoA molecules. Now, when we have unsaturation in the fatty acid like we do here, and as we did in the previous video, we know that our yield for NADH and FADH2 might change. So for FADH2, remember up here we lost out on generating this one. So normally for a saturated fatty acid, to find the number of FADH2s produced, we would simply take the number of carbon atoms, divide by 2, and subtract 1. So that would be 18 over 2, which is 9, minus 1, which is 8. However, we lost out on producing 1 here, so instead of 8, we're only going to get 7 FADH2. Now, in terms of NADH, this is a little bit confusing for most people, and I completely understand why. There is no place in here where we lost out on generating an NADH. Okay? Every single place where we would have had this enzyme, uh, the beta hydroxyacyl coa dehydrogenase, we used it. We generated technically eight NADHs. Okay? However, sometimes what you'll see is the yield down to seven. Why is that? Remember, in this 2,4-dienoyl-CoA reductase, we used an NADPH. 
some sources will sort of group them together and consider that using an NADH or using an NADH equivalent. They are technically different molecules, but I'm going to give you both cases. Okay, So if we consider the NADPH as being similar or the same as NADH, okay, then we essentially are going to only get seven NADHs out. Okay, And again, the reason for that is because if we use an NADH equivalent, like NADPH, we generate eight of them, but we lose one, so we're down to seven. The other way we can look at it is we still generate eight NADH, but we lose an NADPH. So we have a negative one NADPH, but still generate eight NADH. Um, now, which one of those you use or understand probably should depend on your instructor. However, just understand that this is a little bit nitpicky here because NADPH is not technically the same as NADH, but we can sort of think of it as an equivalent. Okay, so hopefully this made sense to you. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but it just takes some practice and going through the pathway a few times, and hopefully it'll make sense. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.